During a trip to the Pripyat police station at Lesya Ukrenka Street, I was able to convince Commander Moskalenko to allow myself and a few other concerned people to perform a search and rescue. If we were not successful, we all agreed that it was not harmful to increase the resources if there were people willing to help. He was, however, adamant that we do this in the morning and return before nightfall. He also made a precise point in his briefing to us that if we encounter any danger, we must blow the whistles that he provided us with. We were all given various very old metal whistles that looked World War II era. They worked very well, so this was enough. The idea was sound. It made sense. I returned home with my whistle and my determination that we would find, at least, an answer to the disappearance of Andre. Perhaps the others that were never found, also. I was resisting the thought that seemed most logical based on the fate of the ones that were found. I hoped that Andre would be a unique success. Sleeping against a tree with a bottle of vodka that he'd procured on his way back from my place. Me being the last person to see him wasn't in my benefit from a criminal investigation perspective. If he is, well, if he is not found in a positive state of existence. Commander Moskalenko did explain to me that he did not suspect that I was guilty of any foul play or wrongdoing, considering pieces of his clothing were found quite a distance away, but I suspect he was a man of belief in something more sinister at play. Something he did not want to divulge. Something that all of Pripyat were aware of, except the recently acquired expatriate. I was aware of much more than they suspected. So inadvertently, we were on the same page. It was an early start the next morning into the forest, meeting at 6.30 a.m. at a designated spot at the forest tree line, just behind the former rail yard building. We would split into groups of two. Of the 28 people that would join the search, we would move forward to cover the length of the forest and straight back using chaining. This was colored thread that we would drag across the lines as we walked to find our way back. The police would provide six of their 28 officers to lead the search. Once again, we needed to return to the rally point by 4 p.m. There would be no wait for those late. They would be called on their mobile phones and if no answer, we had to leave. This seemed shocking to me, but this was the judgment of Moskalenko, so we agreed to abide by this. We all had compasses, whistles, some brought their own knives. Firearms were not permitted outside of official personnel use. I put my warmest clothes together for the next day. Unfortunately, the mornings were chilly, even in April, and there was still some frost on the ground. Although the middle of the day could be quite pleasant, you would never know from the Red Forest. It was always dead. One would think that this was the middle of winter. The forest was a 10 square kilometer area of ginger-colored trees. This gave the Red Forest its name. The high level of radiation absorption of the forest. Many felt that it was named after a, a political joke from the Soviet days. Pripyat, this former modern city of little skyscrapers, now eerie with deserted fields and buildings, originally built within a mile of the plant to house 50,000 people, construction workers, plant workers, and their families. Much of it remained deserted. Many of these buildings remain empty. The people of Pripyat left quickly without their possessions. Workers, then, returned to remove and destroy everything. Tall grass split the sidewalk still. The rides in a children's amusement park stand frozen. All that remains is a cheap factory space and a dead, radiated, copper-colored forest that I was set to penetrate for the first time. I set to bed to get a solid night's sleep with my alarm set for 5 a.m. The sleep was restless, as expected. On brand for all other nights, to be fair. I had made a concerted effort to uncover a pharmacist for melatonin, but couldn't. Wish I'd brought some from Canada. I hadn't, and now I counted sheep, but they kept getting eaten by wolves. I started naming the friends I wanted to see when I returned. Eric, for sure. He was a great guy. A lot of fun, and even for a guy... A truck driver. He was always interested in what you had to say. Very cool guy. But the first to go home. 
He preferred early mornings and less of the bottle. Arnold was obnoxious, but always up for a night out. I had to get him in on the first night out. I needed to see Deborah. She was fun, beautiful, and I knew she liked me. We were just friends, but I know that it should be something more. We never really moved past that. I wouldn't make that mistake when I got back. Smiling faces and laughter flooded my mind. Memories. I hadn't been gone for long, but I was a million light years away, and for that purpose, I'd been gone for an eternity. Most of all, I really wanted to see my parents and sister. Seeing so many sad faces here made me miss their happy faces most of all. So much loss here recently, and people are missing their families, so I appreciated them much more now. I was on the precipice of sleep, warm and comfortable and drifting off. Then, sharp growls like a giant dog trying to snap at its prey. The growl was outside my building. It was terrified, but I was no longer afraid to investigate with caution. In the dark, shaking, I moved out of bed, walking slowly towards my front room window. I bumped into the coffee table with my shin and held the almost released shriek of pain. I can't imagine anyone in my building hearing the same, although they were most likely smart enough to stay under their covers. I couldn't. I was morbidly curious, and after all that's happened to me, I wasn't cowering anymore. I slowly positioned my head between the curtains to get a peek at whatever I could see. In the black of night, my eyes were slow to adjust to the melding of my interior blackness and the exterior of the building. Peering as intently as possible, I made out a huge figure in the car parking lot. It was dark, but the moon gave it shape. I could definitely see two deep red eyes, dull in its glow, but clear in its luminosity. This thing stood a solid seven feet or more off the ground, contrasted by a nearby pickup truck. It had fur that blew around in the wind. It maintained a low growl, but stood stock still. It stared in my direction. I could not tell if it could see me, but I knew that it could. Somehow this window has become a bullseye for beasts. It had long arms and was broad in stature. Its head was low. It was smelling. Its head moved with its eyes closing and opening, smelling something. I knew in my mind that it had me or someone else on its menu. I was certain that this behemoth would not be stopped by a glass window or even a door. I saw it take a step forward with its long clawed feet in my direction. I immediately pushed back from the window. The option for hiding under the bed covers now seemed an incredibly persuasive argument. As it was nearly out of my gaze and my head had passed the curtain, it made a very unexpected sound growled my name. I was certain that I heard a low growl in the form of my name. I was totally tripping. There was no scenario I could craft in my mind that had this thing utter my name. I froze from the unimaginable disbelief and confusion of it. it had called to me. I took one last look and saw that it whipped its head to the side violently and roared while taking on a very terrifying attacking position. This was not for me. This was something else that caught those now squinted fierce eyes and allowed me to see its massive glistening white fangs that were ready to gnash at some unseen prey or predator. It crouched immediately from beyond the parking and the blackness surrounding the beast's space, launched another creature at it, set on attack. It was fast and seemed to fly as I saw no lift from the ground. 
It came fast and with giant jaws that opened as large as its head, with its massive, pegged teeth. It leapt onto the wolf beast with great force, clamped onto its shoulder while wrapping its long fingers across its head, squeezing while biting into the hairy upper arm of this beast. The wolf screamed a deafening scream and with its claws, it scratched the back of this mutant to cause a powerful howl which caused it to release its grip on this wolf thing's shoulder. They were apart and holding their individual wounds. The wolf... werewolf? Wolfman? Whatever it was? It looked in my direction, laser-focused at me, in a pained expression that was... I can't describe it in any other way. Intelligent. Then... In a lightning-fast motion, it leapt off into the night wailing as it became fainter into the distance. The Chudo Visco remained, slumped against the truck, and then produced a long tongue that licked its wound on its upper shoulder. It breathed heavily and regained its posture, standing and tired. It seemed to have no knowledge of my presence. This was good. It then ran into the opposite direction of the wolf. I fell on my ass. I was in shock and soon passed out on the floor until my alarm in the bedroom awoke me the next morning. I was fatigued and sore from little sleep and from the hardness of the floor. I showered, dressed and started out to the rendezvous at the rail yard, now wanting even less to enter these woods. Muskalenko and his team arrived late, approximately 30 minutes late while we, the volunteers, waited. I wasn't surprised. These were not Green Berets or some Ukrainian special forces. They were small town law that saw very little action until recently and, until recently, was more occupied with local strip clubs, late nights and free vodka. They weren't bad guys, but they were also not repelled by opportunism as the armed princes of Pripyat. He apologized with little effort and a vodka-soaked breath and started to break up the groups into groups of 17 pairs. Mine was a baker, a man of about 55, that decided that the best way to get out of his bakery and the oppression of his fat wife was to take a day out in the fresh air. He was Oleg, and was not much of a talker, and for that I am grateful. I wasn't in the mood for small talk. I was in the mood for finding Andre quickly, or not at all but to get in and out of this dead forest as quickly as possible. Besides, his English was nearly non-existent outside of fat wife, big mouth, problems, need day off. Uh, enough said. We started out, compasses in hand, whistles in pockets, and many of us using walking sticks. Less for walking, more for some tool of protection. The morning was cool. The walking began in tall grass on the outskirts of the forest wall. As we drew closer to the forest, my body began playing tricks on me, because it felt much colder with every step. Wind died down upon entry, but then complete silence, outside of the snap of twigs under our collective feet, or the distant sound of water moving through a creek, the odd sneeze or cough or distant comment, but no birds, insects or other animals were evident. Certainly no laughter. The forest was a soul vacuum. It brought about an instant depression. All of the trees were lifeless, perhaps the reason why there were few animals or bugs, nothing to feed on unless you were a termite. We moved forward. The further we moved, the more the group spread apart. Oleg and I were left of center of the groups, and I was glad for his mime act. He was mute until he grunted while he moved through creeks. He was sure-footed, but slow. He seemed to know these woods and how to traverse them, but he was slow. We moved until we knew that we were approximately three kilometers through the ten-kilometer length of these woods. I had a paper map wrapped in plastic. There were no digital maps from our phones. The area was not a Google Maps-friendly spot and still isn't to this day wouldn't matter because we had no Wi-Fi or data access anywhere in the forest. It was bad enough in town. As I walked, I had time to think. I thought about the night before. 
flashes of this short battle between the mutant protectors of Pripyat and the fierce wolf predators that somehow could speak. I still see these dull red eyes and my name being called by the beast. Most of all, I could not unpack the vision of this animal post-fight, looking at me in a saddened way. I felt it in my soul. The eyes. I can't shake that human-like gaze while it clutched its bleeding shoulder before it ran off into the night. Oleg was suffering. He was moving slower and slower as we moved on, and when we hit the halfway point, I believe he understood that he was not able to complete a 20-kilometer walk through uneven ground, hidden roots, streams, and cold. It was taking its toll, and we were losing a lot of time with Oleg's regular stops to sit against a tree to gain his strength and catch his breath. This was not going well. He was once a real courier de bois, real master of these woods when he was young, so he knew them well, or used to know them well enough. Now, unfortunately, he was a liability in getting to the end and back before nightfall. We had already lost two hours with our rate of movement getting to the halfway mark two hours later than expected. Many would be nearing the end by now. I could not give up a large swath of space dedicated to our inspection for the purpose of finding Andre, because Oleg would need to return. I would continue alone and ask him to start going back. I could move faster and try to catch up on lost time. It would allow me to focus more also and miss no space. His grunting and heavy breathing was really putting me off. Oleg shook my hand and turned back. I watched him leave until I was confident he was okay. Then, I would need to make my way to the opposite edge of the forest, and then I was okay to hustle back as quickly as possible. I moved through cold streams, up sheer outcroppings, holding on to roots and through a skeleton forest that looked more like a movie set than a one-time living, breathing landscape. As I neared the far end, I started to spot patches of scattered animal bones throughout. I couldn't tell what animals they were. There were leg bones, rib bones, some white and some moss-covered. Moss, the only living thing able to grow in this boreal radiation experiment, obviously. There were also large cave-like entrances under the larger trees with Massive roots acting as door frames. I was not going to investigate, and was satisfied with leaving those stones unturned, so to speak. I moved on, trying to avoid the sight of bones. This was creepy and deterring. Then, I saw it. A human skull. Clearly, a human skull. It was old, it seemed. This is not good. This is a dead person that clearly the town was unaware of. It looked worn and cracked so it could not be Andre. No way. It was months old, if anything. Either way, I would need to report this to Moskalenko as soon as we returned, or as soon as I was able to get any phone reception. I took a photo with my phone and added a drawn-in marking on the map to indicate the location for the police. When I reached the edge of the ginger forest, ten kilometers of dead wild, I expected to be relieved that I could rush back. I was still behind time. I was a 1.5 hour trip back through the forest. I now had one hour before the sun started to dip. If it was a clear road, I could do it in under one hour, but this is a natural obstacle course. Hills, waterways, outcrops, uneven ground, twist an ankle if not careful. I was also carrying a heavy backpack that was carrying a blanket and some well-wrapped food. It was heavier than I'd expected. The worst part were the spikes coming out of the trees. They were sharp and the tree needles stuck out nearly a foot and could really leave a gash on your face if not careful. I expected to be relieved that I was heading back, but I wasn't. I felt deflated, not having had any sight of Andre. Perhaps the others had some luck. Perhaps I'd return he would be there covered in a blanket. I had to rush. The sun was dipping slightly. I was singing to myself to keep myself occupied. This was either going to keep me sane or push me to insanity. We don't need no vegetation. 
We don't need no plants to grow. In the melody of Pink Floyd's Another Brick in the Wall, just came to my mind, thanks to my surroundings. I decided that I was quickly annoying myself, so I ceased the caterwauling and moved on. At one point, while crossing a shallow stream, I heard twigs snap. This was a very specific sound in the silence. My mind immediately computed a result of me not being alone. This was clear. Were one of the other teams close by, and if so, they surely would have heard me singing or even walking through the forest. I shouted out a, Hello? Immediately wishing I hadn't. Not for any reason other than I felt wrong to place myself on a one-sided radar. The sun was lowering, and it seemed much colder. The skies lit up blue, was quickly turning pinkish gray. I had to hurry, but this new visitor had me concerned. It was seconds after I started pushing forward, a bit faster with a light jog, that I heard more twigs snapping and splashing behind me. Then to my left and right, and in multiplicity, I was being followed by more than one person or animal. Why now? Where was the company earlier in the day? The cold began to really settle in, and I was at least 30 minutes away, judging by the map and compass. I knew where I was based on an open dead clearing, with only patches of grass and slow-moving rivers. These maps were not drawn by any cartographer, but by a group of men from the village that grew up in these woods their whole lives, hunting, fishing, and hiking. Until the accident, of course. Many of them were also lost and found, half-eaten. It was also blamed on a few brown bears, but bears, somehow, were never witnessed. We knew they were nearly extinct, with just a thousand or more left, and they were in some sanctuary or protected. The map was savvy. It was correct, I believe, so I pushed forward with my fellow travelers nearby. For fifteen minutes since the first twig break, and the development of more, there was no engagement. It didn't make sense that I would be followed for so long with no approach. I could have easily intercepted or attacked me, whatever or whoever it was. They knew I was there. I was not exactly hovering over the forest floor. What was their game? Making their moves slowly or perhaps acting as sentries, protecting me through the forest as it quickly darkened. This was neither logic nor expectation. It was merely the most optimistic scenario I could muster for my stress self-preservation. There was nothing I could do about it but move and move fast. This is the only thing I focused on. I did, however, need to maintain a high level of alertness. I remember the trees as dead as they were, not helping to squeeze out any of the remaining light. They were shutting down the day fast. I had some light left, and I wasn't going to waste it. My heart lurched. I was at my most extreme point of stress already, but when I heard it, my heart exploded in my chest. It was the same growly voice that I heard the night before, echoing the same word. My name. My name was being called and every reverberation of that growl pulsated within every cell of my body. This was the wolf. Was it following me? With a group of friends? Immediately after the shock of this distant voice, growling my name stopped me in my tracks. I lit up every neurotransmitter in my brain to dovetail sight and sound and process everything I could in order to make my next move. Then all went silent. No twigs. Footsteps. I wanted to be under my blankets, now more than ever. Or even better, back in Toronto, sipping pints with friends. Non-fanged or peg-toothed friends. I was silent, still, listening. I pulled off my backpack and tossed it to the ground. I didn't need anything slowing me down if I really had to hit the gas in a hurry. I took my phone and water bottle and left the pack behind. I moved slowly because I was afraid to make noise. I had to change my direction into a more diagonal way due to the impending path that would intersect with the growls ahead. I only had my memory of that direction 
where it emitted and elected to circumvent its path. So I moved in a more 45 degree route. I knew that this would easily put me into darkness before I could exit into the village. Perhaps it would take me closer to the market outside of town. I don't care. It would be out of this woodland wickedness. Stepping carefully, I managed a solid kilometer or more. I couldn't see any horizon of non-forest. It was dusk. The day, such as it was at that point, was nearly finished, and we were entering the black of night. I would lose my direction and my senses because there was no flashlight. I intended on sipping my first whiskey by this point, at the pub celebrating the discovery of Andre, healthy and alive. Either way, it was not meant to be there, in the pitch black woods, depending on the light from a dying mobile phone to see a map that does me no good. Because I could not see the landscape. That and surrounded by creatures that were watching, waiting. How could I sleep? What if I kept moving in the pitch dark? It might be my only choice. If I could lose direction and end up deeper in the woods and lost, I could rip my face apart from trees that were invisible ninjas in the blackness, waiting for me to step into the swords of. I would be making unnecessary noises in the dark of night, creating a pattern of a racket. I could lose my footing on an unseen ditch and snap my ankle. What was left of my choices were bleak at best. I wish I'd kept the blanket. It was incredibly cold now. I expected to, at least, reach the end of the forest by dusk. I had to keep going forward, predicting a straight line of the direction I chose. The reassessed direction to bypass the growl. Of course, growls move. Slipping through the darkness quietly, something caught my eyes. The moon provided the vaguest aura of light. I strained my eyes, and I noticed a blackened figure in a clearing, within the halo of a tree line. It was a structure of some kind. A cabin. A small cabin. Maybe an old hunting cabin that was abandoned. Creepy as fuck. But a much-needed respite as long as it was unoccupied. I would have no choice but to stay put for the night. I approached the cabin when I heard more brush footsteps behind me. I rushed towards the cabin and pried the crooked door open and closed it behind me, as much as I could. Using the ambient light of my phone, I surveyed the space inside. It was one large room with an attached pantry space. The walls were warped and had random pictures hung of what I could see to be landscapes and a shelf covering one wall that was empty save for a few plates and cups. The centerpiece was a very old couch, missing a leg, that I wanted nothing to do with. It smelled horrible, and it wasn't something that I wanted to touch, let alone lay on. The place smelled quite musty, and with little light I felt no need to examine the pantry. There was a wood stove in the center of the rear wall. I wanted to get a better look for a rear door with my phone's torch, but I dare not introduce too much light. Sounds and sights were best kept at a minimum. There was enough chaos happening outside with hisses and moans and what I felt was north and east of me and low growls to the south of me. I had no way of keeping anything out. I propped an old table up to the door to provide some resistance if it did anything at all. I tucked into a corner and listened to the unrelenting noises outside. The silence was missed. They were slightly distant, but they existed, and I just knew they would get closer if I waited long enough. The moon was now brighter and fuller. I closed the old dusty torn drapes as much as I could, stayed in my little fetal ball in the corner, nearly behind the old wood stove. I tried to close my eyes and hum quietly to myself to drown out the feral ambience of the woodland denizens. Surprisingly, I drifted off, a light sleep that placed me within a nightmare that existed, in reality, outside of my unconscious eyelids. Figures roamed around the cabin outside, around and around, hunched backs, more than a dozen mutants circled in a pattern, feet dragging, hissing and moaning at one another. Then, in an instant, 
seized upon by dozens of fur-covered beasts. Inches long fangs glistening in the moonlight, swarming the mutants and ripping and gnashing at them in a furious and cruel onslaught until they were all piles of radioactive sinew and meat. Even the wolves wouldn't eat them. They were not safe for consumption, even by lichen standards. It was a nightmare inspired by my racing heartbeat and frayed nerves. Then I woke with a start, a disquiet in the silence of immense volume, a colossal thud near the cabin. Something ran heavily into the cabin, and into the immediate silence following it was a heavy panting. Low, intense breathing, then another bang. It shook the cabin. My heart couldn't take much more of this. I don't pray, but I was strongly considering a reignited supplication to God, any God, all of them if possible. I squeezed into my corner more, two more consecutive thuds while the cabin shook. This weak, worn-down structure wouldn't take much of this. Then the banging stopped, hearing footsteps, not shuffling like his typical of Chudos. These were loud, firm steps, something heavier and more precisely taken. This was the Volkalak. This is a word taught to me by my innkeeper friend Peter. The Volkalak, he said. These are beings that are not part of the nuclear world, not from radioactivity. These are ancient and from the Baba Yaga curse. These were the dominant of the cursed beings, and of all the forbidden violations of nature within the forest, only the Volkalak survived. It preyed upon all other beings, had no equal until the Churoviscos were created during that fateful era. The nuclear meltdown and its radioactive repercussions choked away the Volkalak into deep caves, surviving until they could emerge. They were no more men. Only few could return to human form. The strongest and most resistant and purest. They did not succumb to the sanguine thirst, the need to kill and hunt. They survived only to survive. They rarely returned to human form, as it didn't provide any benefit. They were stronger and safer as Volkalak. All of this stayed with me, but no thought of it until now, because I did not want to have any of it in my mind, or have it being part of my life. I remained motionless. The footsteps came around the cabin until they reached the window. I watched as a large, snouted silhouette passed across the dirty window to the floor. Then, sniffing, I was frozen. The sniffing sound was inside the cabin. The snout... I could just barely see was poking in past the dislodged door. It knew I was there, smelling the scent of my sweat, blood, and most definitely fear. It stopped sniffing abruptly and pulled its nose out. It then rose up. It reached the top of the door as I could see one red eye peer into the opening of the door. And then... then screamed and started to writhe on the ground. I couldn't tell if it was being attacked or not. It was creating a chaos on the ground and screaming and howling and whimpering. It sounded like it was being attacked, but whatever it was, it was in pain. And most importantly, it was away from the cabin. I crawled to the window, tried to gain any clarity through this filthy, blurry window. I saw a shape on the ground. It was hard to make out. Something was laying on the ground. It certainly was not any of the beasts that I have been aware of recently. A dead body? I crawled across the creaking wooden floor, catching splinters along the way in my hands. I reached the door and peered through the opening. 
The cold wind caught my eye and chilled it, which instantly made it tear up. I wiped it with my sleeve and looked out again in the mist. Covered by a small patch of tall grass were legs. Human bare legs. I continued to watch and observe the landscape, 180 degrees or as much as I could from my vantage point. And then, a grunt. This man got to his knees and stood up. Naked. He turned around. It was Andre. I raised my voice to a loud shouting whisper. Andre! He looked up at me, eyes dimly red. He whispered in a tired way. Alex. He then followed up with. Alex. Run. Run. My slowing pulse and relief spun into pants wetting adrenaline. Why, Hundry? Why? He then dropped to his knees and in his last human breath. Please, run, now! Go, fast as you can! Suddenly, he started to twist and contort, screaming in agony. His limbs began to elongate, sprouting nails like ivory spikes on his back on the ground. His body curved upwards, while his face stretched forward, forming teeth, and then with a snap into reality. I ran. Andre was the wolf. Andre was taken, bitten, somehow changed, cursed. I continued to run in the dark. I could only assume that I had a minute before Andre was gone and replaced by an evolved Volkolak, as Peter described to me. I hoped that Andre would maintain some semblance of his human memories and emotions. I had to go. It must have been about 9 p.m. now based on my last glance at my near-dead phone in the cabin. I was not in for a morning sunrise soon. I hoped that I could make it to the- Ooh! My phone poked into a large root, sending me toppling into the dead brush, falling down an outcrop and hitting a tree at the bottom. I was dazed. My leg was fucked. My knee was done, sprained or twisted. Either way, I needed to stay quiet. It'll smell me. Then I heard howls. More howls. There were so many of them. I would be found. I'd be a lichen dinner. I crawled into an open area and saw a building ahead of me. The water tower was just in front of me. I had made it out, except I was battered and I couldn't stand. I crawled, quietly. The mist illuminated by moonlight cast a soup around me and my surroundings. I was bathing in it. Closer to the ground, I had better visibility. The mist hovered waist high and glowed in the night. I pushed forward, elbow crawling. The cassophony grew more chaotic behind me, to the side of me. The trees were cracking against the massive force. I stopped and laid low, motionless, chest tight to the soil. I felt the vibration of heavy footsteps. I knew that I had to try and sprint with this damaged leg, and knew that even if I could get inside the town to someplace secure, it would never be entirely safe just outside the forest. I found a stick on the ground for what good it would do. I felt that anything I could use as protection was better than giving up. I got up on my good knee, did a mental diagnosis of my leg, stretching it a little, and it was twisted up. I hobbled as quickly as I could. The pain was hard on my breathing, which made it more difficult to stay quiet. I got to the edge of the open grass area and to the water tower fence. I had to go around. I couldn't see a single opening. I had no idea how far this fence ran, and wasn't enough light to see the distance I needed to in order to spot my escape point. I moved across the fence. The howls and movement insanity calmed down. I discovered a break in the fence. Looked like the chaining was torn away from the support posts, and I crawled in. There was a long, single-level building. A pop-up-looking office, like an industrial container on raised supports, about a hundred feet from the fence, on the opposite side of the water tower base. I carefully ascended the stairs to the office and tried the door. Locked, as expected. I wandered around, looking for an opening. A window or another door. Nothing was viable for entry. I heard more noise coming from the outer clearing that I just left. Growls, 
sniffing, heavy footsteps. I couldn't run. I couldn't get into the building. I got down and climbed under the structure. I got as deep into the darkness as I could, and I remained silent. <laughs>